those members of Congress have to stand up and tell him he's wrong. They need to tell him this is not what America stands for. This is not what soldiers, airmen, sailors, and Marines laid down their lives for in World War II. And this is not the kind of president our country deserves. That is Lieutenant Colonel Amy McGrath. She says she was the first female Marine to fly an F-18 in a combat mission. Uh, retired now, she is running for Congress against Republican incumbent Andy Barr, who won re-election in 2020 by more than 20 points. She joins me live from Louisville. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much for your service. Thank you, Brooke, and thanks for having me on here. So first, I got to ask, the news of the day, Steve Bannon has been fired. Your response? Well, I mean, I really think uh, Steve Bannon's never should have been in the White House. I, I just believe this is a symptom of, of the president himself. Um, he's like a failing general who's losing the battle, and he's just firing his lieutenants and captains um, to try to make up for his own failures. And, and you know, I just believe that leadership starts at the top, and that's what we need to focus on. We need to focus on him and, and him as a leader and his failures there. So on leadership, you know, and I'm paraphrasing you in the ad, you talked about how it's time politicians have the guts to stand up to the president. You talk about, you know, the emperor has no, no clothes. What do you think they're afraid of? You know, I'm not sure. I think it's, it's a part of the partisan politics that we've had and the fact that we have career politicians who have grown up and they care more about their party and their own reelection. I think it's time we need to have leaders that care more about the country. I think they're afraid of, of of their own party. And, you know, what we need to have is leaders on both sides of the aisle that step up and say, you know, this is America and I stand for something greater than my own party. And but that's your point, that, that's the call to action that I have today. To your point on both sides of the aisle, I mean, some Republicans have spoken up. Uh, I'm sure you've mm -hmm. seen Senator Corker's words, yeah. Republican Tennessee, mm -hmm. you know, and you tell Republicans to speak up. But just to be fair, Amy, mm -hmm. do you think former President Obama or Hillary Clinton should be speaking up right now as well? You know, that's a good question. And, and I think that as leaders of our country, um, even though they're not in an elected capacity right now, that maybe they could speak up. I think it's time for all Americans to, that are in leadership uh, positions to stand up. And the one thing that I'm really disappointed in, uh, for example, with my current opponent, is that he hasn't. He hasn't stood up, uh, he doesn't have the courage to stand up when you know he's either in solidarity with the president who is in solidarity with white supremacists, or he just doesn't have the courage to stand up and say and do what's right. Uh, the president has said many, many times uh, that he wants to work with Democrats, but that they're not giving him a chance. And, and with now Steve Bannon out of the White House come September, do you think that Democrats, members of your party, should give the president a chance? Democrats should give the president a chance when he has or, or comes out with, with policies that uh, are good. You know, I think many and many Kentuckians were uh, looking forward to the, the president coming out with policies on infrastructure, for example. Um, some of these things that, that he talked about doing, people were excited about and hopeful about. But he hasn't been able to do any of it. He keeps getting sidetracked with uh, other things that um, are not what Americans want. And that's, you know, I, I think Democrats can do that when he when the president actually shows up and starts leading. Do you think with regard to your ad, and I, I understand your message about, you know, uh, do you want to stand with the country or do you want to stand with the president? But Amy, do you think it is uh, appropriate to cut a campaign ad not even a week after Charlottesville happened and Heather Heyer has been buried? I do, because I think this reaches to the soul of America. We have to have leaders. Leaders matter. What they say, how they act, what they do matters. And this is about our elected officials standing up and doing what's right. So that's my message. My message is I'm running for Congress in order to be one of those leaders, no matter what party you're from. This is what we need. We need leaders that care about the country over there. Thank you, Brooke. Thanks for having me. Got it. Coming up next, Steve Bannon fired. Now a source close to the White House chief of staff says, chief of staff says he's not done. You love 
Here's some more breaking news for you. Just into CNN, a person close to the White House Chief of Staff, uh, John Kelly, says the top aide is not finished getting rid of people in the West Wing. Uh, Steve Bannon may be his highest profile firing as of yet, but the source tells CNN that the aides who have fostered dissent in the White House are also in sight. Uh, it has been quite a week for the president, who is facing growing backlash over his Charlottesville remarks. General Kelly has been in the role now for less than And now, let's end all of this with a quick moment to honor this week's CNN hero. Uh, Michelle Allen couldn't stand the idea of terminally ill dogs dying alone, so she dedicated her life making dogs know love and comfort and happiness before they pass. This hospice is in our home. And when I say in our home, in every single room of our house, this is the last stop for you. Lucy, come on, sweetie. I don't want them missing out on anything because they didn't get adopted. Oh, so cute. Um, we love seeing all these different hero stories. If you'd like to learn more about Michelle's full story and the dogs, or if you know when some nominal, we really encourage you to please nominate a hero. Just go to cnnheroes.com. And uh, on that note, I've been checking my Twitter. It has been a wild day indeed. Uh, if you want to tweet me, just send me a tweet at BrookeBCNN. I am the same on Instagram. Love the feedback. Everything about it. I'm Brooke Baldwin. Thanks for being with me. Let's go to Washington. The lead with Jake Tapper right now. This is CNN Breaking News. Welcome to The Lead. I'm Jake Tapper. We begin with breaking news in the politics lead, the firing of President Trump's senior strategist Steve Bannon, the architect of the Trump campaign in its last three months, as well as the architect of many of President Trump's more controversial policies and strategies. Bannon was in many ways the beating heart of the populist nationalism in the White House senior ranks, for better or for worse. The move comes within two days of Bannon's interview with the liberal American Prospect magazine, in which he opened up about talk of his internal fights with White House and administration colleagues, and he flat out contradicted President Trump and his posture towards North Korea by saying there is no viable military solution to the conflict. This also comes within a week, of course, of tremendous national controversy over the president's response to the violence surrounding that Nazi Klan white supremacist alt-right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, in which a young woman, Heather Heyer, was killed in an act of domestic terrorism, allegedly by one of these racists. The president initially blamed both sides for the violence and hatred, for which he was pilloried by his fellow Republicans, among others. He made up for that on Monday, clearly condemning the Klan and Nazis, and then seemingly took it all back on Tuesday, when he said there were some very fine people marching alongside the Nazis. The president's seeming sympathy for those in the bigot community has prompted some Democrats to blame Bannon, who was the former chairman of Breitbart, which he had called the platform for the alt-right. The president was asked about Bannon in that wild Tuesday press conference. Look, I like Mr. Bannon. He's a friend of mine. But Mr. Bannon came on very late. You know that. I went through 17 senators, governors, and I won all the primary. Mr. Bannon came on very much later than that. Uh, and I like him. He's a good man. He is not a racist. I can tell you that. He's a good person. He actually gets a very unfair press in that regard. But we'll see what happens with Mr. Bannon. But he's a good person, and I think the press treats him, frankly, very unfairly. Well, we learned today that President Trump said that, knowing that eight days beforehand, Bannon had submitted a letter of resignation, though Mr. Trump had yet to decide if he was going to accept it. That's because long before Charlottesville, Mr. Bannon had been a figure of controversy, wrestling with other top advisors of the president over policy issues. He had also been accused of leaking information to the press. Those who blame Bannon for the president's controversial comments on race and racists, as many Democrats have done, that's not supported by facts. Bannon came on board the Trump campaign, as the president pointed out there, very late in August 2016, three months before the campaign's victory. Now, one year and two months before then, we heard from President Trump these thoughts about Mexican immigrants from June 2015. They're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Bannon was still running Breitbart when President Trump had difficulty finding the words to condemn the Klan and David Duke. With me, 
in February 2016. Well, just so you understand, I don't know anything about David Duke, okay? I don't know anything about what you're even talking about with uh, white supremacy or white supremacists. In June 2016, Bannon was still at Breitbart when the president said that Judge Gonzalo Curiel could not do his job fairly because of his heritage. I'm building a wall, okay? And it's a wall between Mexico, not another country. And in not, my, he's, in he's my a, opinion, he's he is he's Mexican, Mexican heritage, and he's very proud of it. Now, none of that is to excuse or make any judgments at all about whatever advice Bannon gave Mr. Trump, once he came on board two months later, Bannon certainly had his hand in many controversial policies, the temporary ban on travel from a half dozen majority Muslim countries, for example, or the focus on undocumented immigrants and sanctuary cities. Bannon's focus also on wanting a more nationalistic and less what he would call globalist position on trade certainly ran afoul of more traditional chamber of commerce and foreign policy establishment types. But the notion that those troubled by President Trump's response to Charlottesville should now breathe easier because Stephen Bannon is gone, that is not supported by the facts. Something else uh, caught our eye today. Barely a week into Donald Trump's presidency, this photograph was taken of the president speaking by phone with Vladimir Putin in the Oval Office. It now shows just how much has changed in seven months. National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, out by February. Press Secretary Sean Spicer resigned in July. A week later, Chief of Staff Brian Spivas left the White House and now Stephen Bannon has been fired. Look at those four specters. The only two left in this photo uh, who are still in the White House are the only two who were elected, the president and vice president. Of course, don't forget the guy on the other end of the line there, yeah. Vladimir Putin. CNN's Joe Johns is here with me. Joe, Bannon's firing uh, has been in the works. Uh, this wasn't necessarily a direct response to uh, the president's um, reaction to Charlottesville. That's true, Jake. It was the president's decision. CNN has been told, though, we're also told Bannon submitted his resignation back around August 7th. The takeaway here is that Bannon did not jump. He was pushed. A combination of factors at play, including but not limited to the president's well-known irritation with staffers who seemed to be getting more media attention than Donald Trump. There was also that unusually candid interview Bannon gave coming at a time the new White House chief of staff is trying to impose discipline. Yet another bombshell shakes the foundation of the Trump administration. Mr. Trump's controversial chief strategist forced out after a short and stormy tenure at the White House. You know, I can run a little hot on occasions. Bannon's departure comes at the end of a brutal week for the administration. I think there's blame on both sides. But what may have been the last straw for Bannon, a controversial interview the former Breitbart News executive gave to the liberal publication American Prospect undermining the president's North Korea strategy, saying there's no military option to deal with the threat. The official White House statement cited the tough new White House chief of staff, John Kelly, who has been trying to restore order to the West Wing. John Kelly and Steve Bannon have mutually agreed today would be Steve's last day. We're grateful for his service and wish him the best. Bannon, the latest in a long list of top Trump advisors to head for the exits, including Sean Spicer and Ryan Priebus. The president had signaled Bannon's days were numbered in his impromptu news conference this week. He's a good man. He is not a racist. I can tell you that. We'll see what happens with Bannon. A darling of the alt-right, Bannon saw part of his role as keeping the promises the president made during the campaign. Hold us accountable to what we promised. Hold us accountable for delivering on what we promised. The blowback coming from the left and the right. Breitbart editor Joel Pollack reacting to Bannon's ouster on Twitter with one ominous word, war. Minority leader Nancy Pelosi welcomed the firing but said it doesn't disguise where President Trump himself stands on white supremacists and the bigoted beliefs they advance. Bannon's ouster may not quell the blowback from the president's controversial remarks earlier this week. The mother of the woman who was killed in a car attack by an alt-right sympathizer said he has no interest in meeting the president. I just missed his calls. Uh, the call, act the first call, it looked like actually came during the funeral. And there was more fallout still. News today that some top shelf charities were canceling events at Trump's flagship Mar-a-Lago resort, including the American Cancer Society, the American Red Cross, the Susan G. Komen Foundation, and the Cleveland Clinic. All right, Joe Johns, thank you so much. I want to bring in Maggie Hamer Haberman on the phone. She's the White House correspondent for The New York Times. She broke uh, this story, among many, many others. Maggie, thanks for joining us. What's the latest you're reporting about 
how this all went down. So, look, there's, a, there's two, and thanks for having me, two confused versions of this out there. I think that the reality is some mixture of them. Um, you know, Bannon has been uh, said to be in trouble for several weeks. He was supposed to, and Glenn Thrush and I, my colleague, reported this uh, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when Reince Priebus was fired. Um, the president had wanted to make a move then, but a number of people intervened on Steve Bannon's behalf and said that he was going to lose, Trump was going to lose the base if he did this. And these were real people, including Mark Meadows, um, the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. Uh, several others uh, suggested this was a mistake, and that let, let some time pass. John Kelly, the new chief of staff, was evaluating Steve Bannon's role. Um, they had, as I understand it, come to an agreement uh, either mid or late last week about Bannon's departure. But the events around Charlottesville, uh, you know, put all of that off and delayed everything. Uh, and then there was some question of whether um, the deal to have Bannon leave would be looked at again or renegotiated. Once he gave that interview to the American Prospect, the wheels were set in motion. Steve Bannon is not a dumb man, uh, and he is also not a man who is dumb about the way that the media works in terms of on the record and off the record. Um, it would be a little surprising if he thought he was just calling a reporter he'd never spoken with for a gentle chat um, about policy that was not going to go on the record. Somebody close to Bannon has disputed all of this um, and said that he put in his resignation on August 7th to become effective on August 14th, uh, and that that was delayed because of Charlottesville. A lot of reporting contradicts that, but as ever, uh, you know, Jake, it's Trump land. That's so right. uh, things, uh, things are complicated. I appreciate the illusion there. Uh, I'm, uh, doing my, I'm doing my period at <laughs> 4 o'clock on Friday. Uh, Steve Bannon, um, of course, was a former executive chairman of Breitbart News. Already we saw a senior editor at Breitbart tweeting simply, war, the hashtag, hashtag capital W-A-R, war. Um, uh, one of the uh, risks, obviously, that's been talked about is uh, that it's better to have Bannon inside the tent doing his thing out than outside the tent doing his thing in. Is there a risk now for President Trump uh, for somebody who has these uh, nationalistic media outlets out there uh, now being on the outside? I think there's a bigger risk, frankly, for Trump's staff. I don't think that Bannon's going to target the president personally. Uh, and I think that these these sites are going to uh, – I don't think that they have as much sway with a lot of the hardcore voters as they would like to say. If you read the, the comments section on Breitbart, uh, which I do periodically – Why would you ever um, do that? Because, because – Sometimes you need to stare into the abyss, and uh, you know the abyss speaks pretty clearly that uh, voters uh, who follow Breitbart, who supported Trump, still support Trump. And so uh, a lot of this is just sort of railing uh, on one side or another. I do think that people around Trump have a lot to fear. I think that Bannon's not going to burn the whole house down, but I think he might burn parts of it down. That's right. We know of several people that he's clashed with uh, in the administration, including Jared Kushner, Gary Cohn. That's right. Uh, Maggie Haberman, thanks so much. Uh, congratulations again on yet another scoop. Uh, will Steve Bannon's firing help President Trump regain any ground that he lost with the public after his Charlottesville remarks? That's next. Stay with us. We're back with our politics lead as the White House tries to make another course correction with the firing of President Trump's senior strategist Steve Bannon. My panel is here. We've got a lot to discuss. Uh, let me start with Andre Bauer in South Carolina, a strong supporter uh, of President Trump. Uh, what's your reaction? Are you worried as a supporter of the president that firing Steve Bannon might hurt him with the base? I don't believe so. I think Steve Bannon played a great part in this election in getting Donald Trump elected. Um, there's no question that he had a different angle into helping uh, the president in a, in a big primary get out of out of uh, out of that, and he came into the White House. But I think the president is ever evolving, much like he would run a Fortune 500 company. And once that person got what he needed to handled, that was a different. That was a person that helped him get elected, helped him get positioned in the presidency. But now there are different things, and this this is ever evolving. This is America's business, is what the president is tending to, and this gives him the opportunity. I, I, and I appreciate the fact that he was loyal to Steve as long as he was. But now it's about governing, and it's vastly different than getting elected. Caitlin Collins, you're one of our White House re uh, reporters. Uh, how much did the interview that Steve Bannon did with Robert Kuttner of the American Prospect, in which he talked about fighting with colleagues in the White House and the administration, in which he basically revealed that the president was posturing on North Korea and that there was no military viable military option, which was, I thought, a rather stunning admission. How much was that? Uh, did that play a role in this? Well, it was really the last 
draw for the president. He's been fuming over that interview all week, even as recently as last night at his, his golf course in Bedminster, because we've seen from time and time again, every time Steve Bannon is in the doghouse, it's when he gets credit for the for president, the president's success or for winning the election for him. That happened back in April. That was circulating. Bannon was on magazine covers. And the president came out and told a New York Post columnist that he is his own best strategist. So we've seen that. And in this time, since Bannon has fallen out of the president's good graces, he's been maintaining this low profile. He did not travel with the president to New Jersey at all during this working vacation, instead staying in his temporary office in the executive office building while the White House is undergoing these renovations. And he didn't even go to the signing of that trade memo on Monday when the president returned briefly to Washington. The trade's one of his huge issues. That was yeah. unusual because it's something he advocated very strongly for. So we saw that Bannon was really aware of just how in trouble his position in the administration was this time. But it was really that interview where he completely contradicted the president's stance on North Korea, saying there was no military solution. He essentially mocked the president, who has been saying, you know, for weeks now that he was going to respond with fire and fury. And he was also acting like he was the president, saying he could make these personnel changes at the State Department. And that's something Trump does not like. Josh Green, uh, you are the world authority on Stephen Bannon, other than perhaps perhaps Stephen Bannon. Uh, were you surprised by the timing of this? I, I was a little surprised by the timing of it because, uh, you know, the role Trump really plays for Bannon, he, he isn't so much the great manipulator uh, that he's portrayed as being on Saturday Night Live. What he is is Bannon's ultimate soldier and his attack dog when he winds up in these crazy crises where everybody else has abandoned him. Uh, this was true back in the campaign during the Access Hollywood scandal. Uh, Bannon kind of engineered a way out of that for Trump. And we seem to be engulfed in the same kind of situation uh, now in the wake of Charlottesville, where you have every Fortune 500 CEO abandoning Trump, uh, Republicans in Congress abandoning Trump. Steve Bannon is the one guy who stood up for him and publicly defended him. So I'm a little surprised that he was pushed out right now at this pivotal moment for Trump's presidency, because this really leaves Trump without anybody in the White House willing to go out there and defend him against the toughest charges. Uh, and Jen Psaki, you, you worked for the Obama White House, and uh, President Obama made tough personnel decisions. Uh, I don't know that anybody quite as controversial as, as Stephen Bannon, uh, but he fired uh, a couple uh, of national security advisors. I mean, there, there were moves like that. Uh, how, much does some, how much difference does it make to fire somebody like that? Well, you can argue that Steve Bannon's role or relevance in the White House was overstated. Um, certainly, he was a big part of the campaign, and that, I think, was because he shared, he helped promote an ideology they shared. But no one staffer typically changes, ultimately, the ship the president is leading himself. So for President Obama, I remember one of our early firings was the social secretary. That seems quite quaint at this point That's in time. Right. Right. That seems quite quaint at this point in time. Now, Steve Bannon's role, what's clear from this is that if you're on the wrong side of Jared and Ivanka, you're probably at risk on the chopping block. If you are promoting yourself, um, as a number of people have said here, that's not something the president likes. Um, that's not uncommon for a president. But typically, even with this White House, it's not going to necessarily change the, inter the entire internal dynamic, I wouldn't suspect. One thing I wonder, Caitlin, uh, Steve Bannon was um, a, a, a voice for um, reducing the American military footprint uh, abroad, such as in Afghanistan. Uh, is there anyone else now in the administration that could hold that argument, that would make that argument? You have Mattis, you have McMaster, uh, Jared Kushner. Is there anyone that might be saying, we actually should be sending fewer troops abroad, not more? Well, that's exactly the question that has been on everyone's mind this week. You know that the president is at Camp David in a meeting with his national security team right now. And we know that they're discussing Afghanistan, but that's what everyone has raised since Bannon has left. There are a lot of people who didn't think he belonged in the White House. But that, that is the question. Who is left in the White House that will advocate for that position? Because as you look, the people who are in this White House aren't typically conservatives who think that that should happen. We've got, you know, the Dina Powells, the Gary Cohns, the Ivanka Trump, the Jared Kushners. So people are wondering how many conservatives are really left in this White House with a Republican president. Yeah, I don't know if conservative's the right word. Nationalists, maybe. It's, it's a different. All the words don't mean anything anymore. Everyone stick around. We're going to take a very quick break. We'll be right back. We're going to take a look over perhaps the toughest week President Trump has had. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the lead. Let's stick with our politics lead as we cover the ongoing White House staff shakeup as the president's chief strategist, Steve Bannon, is the latest to be shown the door. Uh, Josh Green, let me ask you, do you think that there will likely be other individuals in the White House that General Kelly says, time to go, buddy? I think there's a pretty good chance that people like Sebastian Gorka will get pushed out and some other Bannon loyalists uh, who are not particularly well liked by the faction that remains in the White House, uh, because you're really going to have a culture change in a vacuum now that Bannon has left. And as odd as it sounds in a Republican White House, you're going to have an administration effectively controlled by Democrats. You've got uh, Gary Cohn, a former Democrat, Stephen Mnuchin, Jared and Ivanka. Uh, and other people in, in, in the White House who don't have a, a traditional Republican background uh, and who certainly don't have the nationalist, populist politics that Bannon pushed so hard, maybe too hard, uh, from his job in the West Wing. Andre Bauer, one of the things uh, that uh, Trump supporters are worried about uh, is that uh, now Breitbart, the, the website the, uh, that Bannon said he wanted to be the platform for the alt-right, now it will be weaponized even further. Obviously, it has gone after uh, Bannon's rivals within uh, the White House, Reince Priebus, uh, Jared Kushner, Gary Cohn, and others. Now with Bannon out of the White House, um, people say, who knows? I mean, that likely will not attack President Trump, but there will likely be other people in the administration. Does that matter? Well, it does matter. You want every friend you can get when you're trying to govern. And at some point in time, this president has got to try to work with the with the legislative branch. And any time there's chaos or someone stirring the pot, that makes it more difficult. And we've seen that by falling just one vote short sh on health care. Every vote matters. And so if he can just cause a little chaos, it, it stops not only what the president is allowed to get done, but what the people of this country sent him to do. I want to uh, talk about Charlottesville just for a second. Uh, Caitlin, uh, there was a remarkable moment on Good Morning America uh, today uh, with Susan Bro, the mother of Heather Heyer, who was viciously killed uh, by a domestic terrorist, uh, likely one of those racists uh, marching. Um, and this is what she had to say about the phone calls um, and whether or not she would talk to President Trump. Let's roll that tape. I have not, and now I will not. Um, at first, I just missed his calls. Uh, the call, act the first call, it looked like actually came during the funeral. I'm not talking to the president now. I'm sorry. Uh, what after did you what he said about my child, and it's not that I saw somebody else's tweets about him. I saw an actual clip of him at a press conference equating the protesters, like Miss Hire. Uh, with the KKK and the white supremacists. This is a, a disaster. Um, and uh, maybe in any other White House, this would be the biggest story of the day, but it's the Trump White House, so it's not. First of all, the sheer incompetence calling during the funeral. But then second of all, um, here you have this grieving mother who is obviously offended by what President Trump said. It's, it's awful. Is there any inclination that, that the White House is going to try to fix this in any way? That's a great question. We actually have not heard back from the White House on that. We've been asking them since Heather Heyer was killed on Saturday, have they reached out to her? What was the plan? And they kept saying that they were coordinating a call. They were making t a time that's convenient for the family. And until that interview this morning, we found out that she did not want to speak to them, that they had called during the interview. So it shows why they had not been returning our request for comment or answering when the call was going to be set up. And it really shows you the difference in the president. I mean, when the OSU attack happened and the guy ran the car into some students and got out with a knife, the president flew down there and went and saw those students and, saw and you know, talked to them and talked to the victims. And it really shows, you know, he did not travel to Charlottesville after all this happened. And you're exactly right. In any other day, in any other White House, this would be the biggest story of this week. But it really shows that they haven't even called the mother of the girl who was killed from Saturday. Yeah, they haven't gotten through to her. Anyway, Jen Psaki, um, I want to ask you about President Obama because I have heard from uh, liberals and progressives disappointed that they have not heard more from President Obama uh, this week after uh, horrific racial tensions, uh, uh, the death of a young woman protesting the Klan. Uh, he did send out some tweets in which he quoted Nelson Mandela, and I recognize that he achieved Twitter history, that one of them became the most retweeted or the most liked tweeted in, in, all, uh, in, in all time. But uh, do you wish that he did more? Do you wish that he spoke out more this week? 
As an American, sure, because I think for eight years, people were used to him rising to the moment when there was a crisis. And even people who don't like him or don't like his politics, I think would probably say that when the country needed somebody to be a moral leader, he was there. Uh, but he thought a lot about what role he wanted to pay, play post-presidency, and he wanted to leave room for other people to rise to the moment. I think a lot of people have. All right, Jen Psaki, thanks so much. Great panel. Really appreciate it, everyone. Uh, one of the few black Republicans in Congress will react to the president's words on Charlottesville. That's next. With breaking news in our politics lead, White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon has been fired from the Trump administration. Joining me now to talk about this and much more is Republican Congresswoman Mia Love of Utah. Congresswoman, always good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Jake. So do you support the president firing Steve Bannon? Well, I support any changes in the White House at this point. Um, you know, I think that this is this is probably a, a showing of uh, General Kelly shaking things up, knowing that things aren't going quite well in the White House. And, you know, I, I think that this might be a good move. Um, hopefully anything is, is better than nothing. The ouster comes, of course, after the president's uh, initial response uh, to the Klan and no Nazis marching on Charlottesville. I, I want to read to, to you some of what former Republican presidential candidate and Utah resident Mitt Romney said on Facebook today. Quote, uh, what the president communicated caused racists to rejoice, minorities to weep, and the vast heart of America to mourn. The president must take remedial action in the extreme. He should address the American people, acknowledge that he was wrong, apologize, state forcefully and unequivocally that racists are 100 percent to blame for the murder and violence in Charlottesville, unquote. Uh, do you agree uh, with Governor Romney, and do you think that would make a difference? I think now more than ever, people in the United States and even throughout the world need certainty and leadership. And um, it would have been nice to get that. But this goes to show, I said this before, that we have to stop looking to Washington to solve all of our problems, to tell us how to feel, what to do. We have to start looking within and making sure that we are the ones that are being the examples out there. So that way, no matter what happens in the White House, the people are still voicing their opinions, their concerns, and they're the ones that are writing history. You participated in a unity rally uh, this week in Salt Lake City, and you said that racism is not only taught, but that more importantly, it can be untaught, it can be reversed at the rally. Uh, you also came face to face with a white supremacist. We're showing a picture <laughs> of it right now. He's having uh, problems uh, well, with uh, the idea of holding signs <laughs> upside down and right side up, but not a surprise, I suppose. What would, yeah. you, what would you say to this gentleman if you put down his up, upside down san, sign? What would you say to him to try to convince him to abandon his hateful ideology? I think first and foremost is you can tell that that man, I'm not a victim. He's got no um, influence on me one way or the other. As a matter of fact, I looked at him and I knew that there was something that was off about him. And I was just kind of thinking, oh, poor guy can't even hold his sign up correctly. <laughs> but, you know, this to me, got, again, goes to show that, you know, we have to be really comfortable in our skin, stand very comfortable in our principles so that when idiots like that show up, that we are not victims, but we are empowered, um, that we can be a great example to them. So we have to remember that I, me and everybody else who thinks like me, who believes in unity, who believes in diversity, who care about people based on the content of their character, not the color of their skin, can, can stand up and have make sure that this person has no influence over us, that this person is the one that is feeling completely alone and has to change their minds and knowing that they're the ones that are flawed, not us. A new CBS News poll uh, out this week showed that 67 percent of Republicans approve of the way President Trump handled the response to the Charlottesville attack. Um, I, I suppose you're not in that 67 percent. Um, but does that surprise you that so many people in your party approved of his response? I think um, what surprises me the most is that there's so many people that are looking to the president for response. I can tell you right now what my kids care more about what I say on Twitter, my actions, than they do about what happens at the White House. And I would guarantee that most Americans that have children or have somebody that looks up to them would care more or are affected more by what they do, what they say, how they respond than they do about somebody else. So it's time for us to make sure that we are the role models. And again, I didn't, when watching what was going on with Charlottesville, I didn't have to wait for a president to tell me how to react or how to feel. 
I knew exactly um, what I needed to do and how to represent the, how to express the voice of the people that I represent. And that's exactly what I'm going to continue to do. And I'm pleading um, to everyone that is listening right now that it is time for you to take the power back into your hands. Don't wait for Washington. Don't wait for somebody to tell you why you should be angry and how to behave when you're angry. Just, just make sure that you are the one that is expre expressing love, unity, and that American patriotism that is... Um, that believes in individual liberties and, and freedom and love. Republican Congresswoman Mia Love of Utah, it's always great to have you on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jake. An American. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin is uh, feeling a little bit of heat now as the firestorm over the president's Charlottesville remarks has intensified. Mnuchin was one of the cabinet members uh, standing by the president as he tried to defend protesters rallying with neo-Nazis and Charlottesville. Nearly 300 of the secretary's classmates at his alma mater of Yale just signed a letter to him, and at part, uh, this is how it reads. President Trump has declared himself a, self a sympathizer with groups whose values are antithetical to those values we consider fundamental to our sacred honor as Americans, as men and women of Yale, and as decent human beings. President Trump made those declarations loudly, clearly, and unequivocally, and he said them as you stood next to him. We can be Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Greens, and a number of other things, still be friends, classmates, patriots, but we cannot be Nazis, white supremacists. We can disagree on the means of promoting the general welfare of the country, on the size and role of government, on the nature of freedom and security, but we cannot take the side of what we know to be evil. With me now, James Donilon. Uh, Mnuchin's former classmate who actually uh, wrote the letter, Matthew Countryman, who is the one who started this whole thing. So, gentlemen, welcome to you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So, Matthew, you took this idea to your Yale Class of 85 Facebook page. I, we, we understand the why from reading the letter, but how quick was the response? Instant, actually. So, I, um, I'd heard that Trump had said something, but I didn't get to see the video the early evening, uh, and it, I was so shocked. And to see my classmate there um, saying not a word was just so disturbing, so upsetting. Um, to give validation to the forces of, of racial hatred in our past was really just more than I could take. Uh, and so I just expressed myself on the Facebook page. I just I didn't know how much people would feel the same way I did. I didn't know whether this would. Um, get people to act, but I just wanted to know. I, and I literally asked the question, who, who was willing to call for him to resign? And, and the response was, was instant. Um, yeah. James among them, and, 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 and not you know, people I didn't know necessarily well, sort of not in touch with, but um, it was really widespread, too, that people wanted to find a way for us to express our revulsion. So, teamwork here. James, you're the one who takes it upon yourself. You write this letter. I understand it took you all of 20 minutes to, to fire this thing off. Let me hear just in your own words why you want Mnuchin out. Well, there comes a point when ordinary politics is left behind and a moral absolute imperative comes to the fore. And I think we've reached that point now that uh, Trump has said what he said. He said it very clearly. He really meant it. And our esteemed classmate was standing next to him. That in itself is a statement. You can't stand silent when something like this happens. What it about, has to be something you confront. But what about if you look at it from the flip side of this? Both of you, James, to you first. You know, thinking that maybe the nation needs someone like Mnuchin in the White House, who is Jewish, who is presumably disturbed by those comments from, you know, of the presidents from Trump Tire Tower inside the cabinet. I mean, it. it it, it, that it's too risky to put someone unknown there, James. You know, I understand and appreciate that argument, but we've reached the point where we're basically enabling a failing administration, and we need to accelerate Trump's departure and the shutdown of normal business uh, in the White House as soon as possible. And in particular, I think uh, we can really think about what it means to be in the leadership. I have no doubt that the good civil servants of the Treasury Department will keep the place running very well in Mr. Mnuchin's absence, should he decide to resign. Um, it's whether one promotes the ideological basis of the Trump administration that is most important. 
I think anybody who is associated with that on the side of the political appointees, the higher offices of the Trump administration, I think it's time to get out of there. Do you, it's my understanding neither of you have Secretary on speed dial. I don't, I don't think you're super close with him, but, but Matthew, I mean, how I, I imagine he holds Yale near and dear to him. And, you know, d d does anyone from your class of 85 talk to him regularly? And how much sway do you think that this letter might have on him? You know, I'm not sure sway is the issue. I think, nor do I think his Judaism is the issue. I think the question of basic moral principle, right? Are, are you willing to participate in a in a, an administration that's giving license to uh, political forces uh, of, the, of racial hatred, of, the, of our racial past, um, that is in fact standing against the kinds of efforts to build a multiracial, multiethnic, religiously, religiously diverse uh, democracy. Um, these are not political questions in my mind. These are questions of moral judgment. Uh, and you know, I hope he hears our message. I hope mm -hmm. that the people who do talk to him, I'm sure he has classmates he's close to. I'm sure there are people who are very dear to him who feel the same way. I would expect that there would be. I, I don't know them, but I'm sure they're there. And I hope that this message gets through, that, that this is not a matter of the debt ceiling or of the infrastructure project uh, or anything else. This is a question of